Okay, hello and welcome everybody. I think we'll get started. Um, and, and I think others will maybe trickle in from other sessions. Um, so welcome to thematic session 4B. Uh, we'll have a couple sessions today on the prevention of violence against children. I'm Selena Jensen. I'm the focal point for the assessment, measurement, and evidence working group of the Alliance. And I'll be moderating this session today. So I'm so pleased that you are joining us for this important session, um, which highlights both examples of community-led approaches and social behavioral change approaches to prevent violence against children. Um, as we get started, I'd firstly like to introduce our panel of presenters. Um, so we have here with us, Dr. Mike Wessels, Dr. Kathleen Costelny, and Mr. Ken Andoro, who will be presenting on preventing the sexual exploitation of girls in Kenya, the power of local ownership and a community-led approach. Uh, Dr. Wessels is a professor at the School of Public Health at Columbia University. He is an experienced practitioner researcher who leads multi-country learning using mixed methods about the effectiveness and scalability of community-led processes of preventing violence and other harms to children. Dr. Costelny is a senior researcher at the Child Resilience Alliance, where her research focuses on child protection and children's psychosocial well-being in armed conflicts and disasters. She is currently lead international researcher for a multi-stage action research program in Kenya on strengthening community-based child protection mechanisms. And Ken is a research associate uh, yeah, at the Child Research the Alliance. Uh, if you I have your mic on, Italian. can you please turn it off? <laughs> Thanks. Um, I'm not sure if you all heard me. So Ken is a research associate at the Child Resilience Alliance, and he is currently the lead national research in Kenya on the interagency community-led child protection work. For the past decade, Ken has worked at the grassroots level with communities to facilitate community-led child protection initiatives, as well as lead research activities. So welcome to our first group of presenters. And then in the second half of this session, we have here with us Clemence Quint, who will be presenting on Project Kudwa, which focuses on leveraging behavioral and social sciences to prevent violence against children and women in Lebanon. Clemence is a social and behavioral change expert and the co-founder of Magenta, an organization dedicated to leveraging social and behavioral science to improve the life of the most lives of the most vulnerable. So over the past few years, Clemence has worked extensively with UNICEF to use social and behavioral change approaches to prevent violence against children. So it's truly an expert group of presenters, and I'm so happy that you are all here with us today to share your knowledge and learning from the work that you have led. So just to go over briefly. Um, we're aiming to keep you as engaged as possible um, and the session as participatory as possible. So we'll include both presentations, opportunity for Q&A and small group discussion, as well as use of some tools like Mentimeter. Um, we would like to request all of you in preparation for small group discussions, if you can write your language preference, if you prefer to be um, in a specific language group, if you can just write um, the E-N-S-P-F-R-A-R in front of your name. Um, so you'll see an example here from my, um, that I have provided. Um, and if you don't have a preference, you can leave it as is, or we'll place you um, in an English group uh, as a default. But if you prefer to be um, speaking in a specific language, please, um, add that to your rename yourself now, that would be great. Um, 
And if you also want to add that or in addition to that, where you're calling in from um, or um, what agency you work with, it's just a nice and simple way to also get to know each other a little bit. Um, so during the small group discussion, there will be a timer. You'll have about 10 minutes um, and we'll indicate when you have a minute left and then you'll be automatically placed black back in plenary for discussion. Um, so as we, we would also like to invite you to uh, share your, turn on your screens if your bandwidth permits and if you feel comfortable with that both now, um, but also in small groups. Um, oh, that slide, you might have to click a few times. Great, I didn't realize that was like that. Um, and as in any face-to-face -face, uh, training, please make sure that you mute yourself um, unless you're asking questions or um, contributing in small groups. Um, and that I think is all from my side. So thank you very much um, and welcome everybody. So as we're getting started, we have, uh, we'd like to share with you a Mentimeter question, which you'll find in the chat. Great, so we wanted to hear from you what best describes the organization you work with. So it looks like it's international NGO. So a few couple from academic institutions, government, UN agencies, and then the majority of you are working with international NGOs. Okay, great. We do have Simon, I see your message in the in the chat. You might be the only local partner representative. Regional network, great. Um, we can move on to the next question when everyone's ready. So we'd like to get an understanding from you um, how familiar you are with working on prevention interventions in, in child protection. Great, so it looks like a few of you have theoretical knowledge, great. Quite a few of you have practical experience, some more limited knowledge, so that's great. We'll um, certainly learn from our presenters here today. I think we can move on to the next question. We also, given the focus of this session, wanted to understand better how familiar you are um, working on community-led approaches. That's great. So a lot of you look like you are somewhat familiar. Um, so we'll definitely learn from the presentation today. And then last but not least, our final question, um, similar, how familiar, familiar are you working on social behavioral change? Great. So somewhat familiar again. Very familiar, great. Okay, that gives us a little bit of an idea. Um, so we look forward to the presentations and I'm sure that you'll have also many questions for the presenters as well. Um, so thank you for filling in those questions. Um, I'll. 
be aiming to, to monitor questions that may come up in the chat during the presentations. Um, any of you could also, following the presentations, there'll be a Q&A. So I'll note some questions down or you can save your questions until the Q&A start. But without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Mike, Kathleen, and Ken for the first presentation. Thanks very much, Selena. It's a real honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, we're talking about primary prevention, and I think it's uh, fairly clear that it requires a mix of uh, top-down and bottom-up and middle-out work. Um, you know, if you were going to try to uh, eliminate sexual abuse of girls, for example, one would surely need to have uh, in place strong national policies uh, that um, prohibit and, and criminalize sexual exploitation of girls. Yet at the same time, we need to have a strong civic arm. People need to be uh, mobilized around such an issue. They need to take responsibility for it. They need to be to empower themselves uh, to uh, address it. And so that uh, is a bottom-up kind of approach that is internally driven. And the potential value of this is that the majority of child protection work is actually done by families and communities. And I think if we want something sustainable, uh, we need to uh, embed the processes of prevention uh, in uh, community and, and family level. So um, I'm going to uh, talk about a, um, a participatory action research uh, project that we undertook together, uh, Kathleen, uh, Ken and I, along with some other uh, wonderful local uh, collaborators, on addressing uh, early sex uh, in girls. And it's going to show that communities themselves are agents of primary prevention. They themselves, it turns out, can look upstream and think about the drivers of problems like teenage pregnancy, early marriage, and sexual exploitation uh, of girls. Um, in contrast to what a lot of international work has done, they focus not on the uh, you know the proximal problems, the you know the teenage pregnancy and so on, but they actually look to the root causes. So we're going to give uh, an example of how they uh, of how they did that. My view is that uh, our role is to uh, document, test the effectiveness of and learn from some of these uh, local uh, initiatives. And so that was the spirit of our work. The work itself um, is an extension of the interagency uh, learning initiative on community-based child protection mechanisms and child protection systems. And this was a highly collaborative uh, venture coordinated by Save the Children, whom I wish to thank. And I also want to thank UNICEF and uh, World Vision, who have also partnered uh, on this important work. So. Um, Turning to the work, the flow uh, of this is going to be that uh, I will, uh, 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 you know, having, having introduced, I'll uh, turn over to Kathleen, who's going to talk uh, a little bit about the, um, uh, uh, the nature, the design of the research, and also its uh, main results and impact. And Ken is going to tell us uh, more about the uh, uh, process. So let me go ahead and begin the share screen and we will get right into the... Uh... Okay, over to you, uh, Kathleen. Yeah. So hello everyone and, and glad to be here. Um, so I'm going to talk, I'm going to skip, <laughs> skip to the, uh, the design of the research. So the purpose, as Mike has said, was to um, develop and test the, effective, the effectiveness of a community-led approach to child protection. So first there was uh, rich qualitative learning through a rapid ethnographic approach where Kenyan researchers actually lived in the communities, and they were learners who learned from different groups, from um, girls, from boys, from women, from men, from youth, from elders. Uh, what they viewed 
viewed as the most serious uh, harms to children, and then what the community actually did once these harms happened, and also looked at if they had used any aspects of the formal uh, child protection system. The findings were then fed back to the communities and asked if uh, the learners had gotten it right. The second phase focused on identifying child well-being outcomes as defined by local people themselves. And surprisingly, this differed quite a bit from uh, Western concepts of um, well-being. The next phase was a quasi-experimental design with a randomly selected intervention group and then a comparison group. There was a baseline data collection uh, using mixed methods, time one, uh, and then the intervention. And uh, this was uh, an intervention that the community decided on. They decided what harm they wanted to address, which turned out to be um, children engaged in uh, early sex, as they called it as this was uh, very common in children um, under 12 years old. They also decided how they would do it. And Ken will talk about this uh, process in uh, greater detail. Finally, there was an end-line data collection at um, time two. So uh, what were some of the key elements of the community-led process? First, there was extensive collective reflection and dialogue, which was supported by a facilitator. And um, the community decided itself to address early sex because they saw it as um, a root cause and leading to other harms, such as teen pregnancy and child marriage. Second, there was collective decision-making and responsibility. There was child and youth leadership. So girls as well as boys decided to engage in football practice and tournaments, which were combined with life skills sessions and a space for then discussing about making decisions about how to avoid early sex. Fourth, the community linked with other services. There was also mentorship and peer education where well-respected members of the uh, community um, served as mentors and girls who had participated in the um, life skills training served as peer educators to other girls. Throughout the community, constructed culturally relevant activities and included um, engaged in inclusion and outreach activities, and they were legitimized by uh, local authorities such as religious leaders, village elders, and the chief. It's also worth noting that during this process, the activities focused at different levels of the community's social ecology, such as uh, family, peers, uh, the larger community. And this occurred naturally as part of this whole process. So just briefly, some of the key findings. Um, first, there was reduced early sex. Uh, the percentage of children who reported that it was common for eight to 11 year old girls to engage in early sex declined from 45 to uh, 21%. And this was confirmed by triangulation with uh, other methods and with the qualitative data. There was reduced early pregnancies. Uh, so previously it was very common for girls who were 13 to 15 years old to become pregnant and they would subsequently drop out of school. And at the end line after, um, after this community led intervention, there were zero pregnancies in the preceding year. And in comparison, uh, the uh, other community uh, in just one class in one school alone, eight out of the 30 girls in like the equivalent of our eighth grade here in one class had become pregnant in uh, the previous 12 months. So um, as a result of that, there were also more children in school. Uh, the intervention community had an increase in children in school, while the comparison community had a decrease of children in school. There was also a stronger connection with parents and caregivers. Um, children reported that parents talked to them more about their future, about their school activities, about sex and pregnancy. And parents also reported um, 
positive interactions with their children. For example, they talked more with them about sex and pregnancy than in the other community. So in closing, just the key takeaway is the importance of community ownership and having the power and decision-making in the hands of local people. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Ken. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you, Kathleen. Yeah, so I will just describe uh, uh, the process, uh, how it happened. So uh, as Kathleen and Mike has alluded to, is that the process was purely community led. And our role was to ask questions, uh, mainly to facilitate uh, the whole process. So when we got into the community, we asked uh, uh, the community how would they like to uh, how would they like us to proceed from the ethnographic phase. So at the learning phase, we 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 created a very good relationship with the community. So they were aware what. Uh, our intentions were in the community. So when it came to the, uh, the facilitation phase, we started with doing a feedback session. And the feedback session was basically sharing the, the findings of the learning phase and uh, requesting the, uh, uh, I mean, engaging the communities to find out whether the findings resonated with them or not. After that, we uh, engaged the communities to, to Try and suggest how would they like to proceed, having learned that uh, uh, there are so many harms that affect children in that community, and uh, the communities got interested in addressing uh, uh, one of the harms to children. And so, uh, the first phase entailed engaging the community to identify one particular harm uh, to address um, the community. So there were a lot of deliberations back and forth. At the end, the community decided to address um, early sexual debut. And then having settled on a harm, we engaged the community to, uh, to try and, uh, and come up with activities or decide on how they would like to address uh, uh, early sexual debut. So, and this was happening in larger community uh, meetings where we mobilized all the community members and uh, sat down and had a discussion with them. So uh, out of that, they decided to split it different, uh, in different subgroups and discuss how they would like uh, uh, to address the early sexual debate. And the reason um, they split into different subgroups was because the larger group meetings that we had in the community, we realized that there were conflicts between children, youth, and uh, and. Uh, the older people in the community. So there was a lot of blame games uh, back and forth. So uh, having split into different subgroups, uh, the parents went on their own and the children went the, on their own. And uh, uh, the parents had their own deliberations and decided to do something on, on parents. Uh, uh, children, both boys and girls also went on their own and decided to do something on, on football as well as the life skills, though they didn't call it life skills, but they wanted to learn uh, about issues of, uh, uh, of self-esteem. They wanted to learn about uh, issues of sex and issue and risks that come with, uh, with sex. So uh, after that deliberation, the facilitation phase took about uh, one year. Then they went into, into the action phase. The action phase is where the parents organized themselves in groups and uh, had uh, uh, discussions among themselves. And some of the things they discussed were about guiding and counseling, especially the teenagers. Uh, the, the children, girls had a girls football team where they used to meet uh, and play. And uh, uh, after playing, uh, 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 organized, um, um, a station where they discussed issues affecting them. So both boys and girls. Other than that, there were also uh, group tournaments that boys and girls uh, uh, organized. And in those group tournaments, they had several messages that 
that talked about uh, early set uh, that they shared with other members of the community. So that also happened over a period of uh, uh, more than one year. And then there were process where the, the communities that engaged in the activities started reaching out to the neighboring uh, neighboring uh, communities. That is what we are so basically that is uh, how the process was so there was an end there was uh, uh, a phase where the community decided to settle on one harm and then they came up with the activity how to address uh, the, the harm that they, they chose is early sexual abuse and then they decided uh, how to uh, conduct those activities that they said thank you Back to you, Mike. Thank you so much, Ken, for that. Yeah, thank you. So um, just to wrap up, I wanted to highlight a, uh, several themes that I think are important for us to think about. Um, the first is the importance of working upstream, uh, you know, rather than working on the immediate problems, looking at drivers and precursors. And here we see that communities themselves are good at doing this. They don't tend to put things in boxes the way that uh, we humanitarian uh, workers often uh, do. They think uh, very, very holistically. Secondly, they achieved high levels of local responsibility and ownership. This was not uh, a small group process, uh, rather a whole community process that over time built up a head of steam. More and more people came in, particularly as they saw it having positive results as the girls got excited. It even began spreading to other uh, uh, villages, which we can say uh, more about. And that ownership is really quite key because it produces uh, ongoing collective responsibility, which means that there's a higher chance of sustainability. In the field of child protection, I would say that sustainability remains one of our big challenges. And yet we know that um, sustainability is absolutely critical uh, for accountability and for long-term uh, well-being, especially since, as the Alliance um, uh, Prevention Note points out appropriately, um, prevention is an ethical imperative. You know, this is not just something that's nice to do. It's really terribly important to do, and it's part of our um, responsibility and accountability to local people. So I'm going to stop there, and um, I look forward to uh, comments, questions, and reactions as we as we move forward. Thank you very much. Over to you, Selena. Thanks very much, Kathleen, Mike, and Ken. Uh, I find it incredible that there were zero pregnancies. I think, given that the majority of the participants on this call today are working with international agencies, UN agencies, this is an important example. A reminder of how important it is to work with communities and ask communities what their priorities are and what child protection systems are already in place that can be strengthened. Um, so we're going to open up to Q&A. So please um, feel free to write your questions in the chat, or if you'd like to unmute yourself, um, please do and ask the presenters questions directly as well. I don't see anybody typing in questions. Hi, this is Sandra. I have a question for you. Um, I can turn my video on if you want. Um, I, I'd just like to know how long was the process because Ken mentioned mm -hmm. uh, it took a year for the community to agree on what was important and then how to address it. So I'm curious to know like how long was the whole study and um, particularly why it took so long for the community to, to, to come with um, how to address the issue that they had selected. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra, for that good question. Uh, the study itself uh, was about two and a half years and the the process is uh, designed to be a slow one that moves according to community time. 
And this, of course, poses challenges for those of us who deal with donors that follow our rigid log frames, timetables, and, and uh, externally uh, driven expectations. But um, if it seems like a long time to sort of get up and running the year that Ken mentioned uh, to decide and uh, you know, um, uh, actually begin the uh, community-led action, um, one way of thinking about this is that the dialogues that antedated the selection of the harm to children, uh, which was necessary for developing a plan and enabling the action, those dialogues are actually part of the intervention process. I think that's the best way to understand them because they collectivize um, the, uh, the view of what the community's priority is. Um, they involve um, sort of uh, delving into collectively what are the issues that children in our community face, which ones are most significant, and how do they interrelate? I mean, in this situation, uh, communities themselves understood the interconnection between early sex and uh, teenage pregnancy uh, and early marriage, as, as Ken said. And that insight, achieving that collective insight, is part of the intervention process. And so it looks like a very long time, and it is by traditional program standards, but I would argue that, uh, you know, it can occur in Sierra Leone and India, it has occurred um, uh, more quickly, um, and it has also occurred more slowly. So it really depends on a lot of the circumstances of, of communities. But that dialogue process is fundamentally about um, changing the power dynamics within communities, having women and young children achieve a voice that they've never had before, uh, and it's worth that going slow. And at the end, uh, what one gets is uh, uh, more sustainable prevention. So thanks for that. Thank you. We have a few other questions coming up in the chat. So Oko has uh, asked about regarding communities choosing issues they want to address. Communities usually don't prioritize child protection risks. They choose infrastructure, livelihoods, et cetera. How did the communities choose sexual abuse? So we started out um, talking about, um, you know, children out of school and then uh, pregnancies was a big um, issue for them. You know what, I, I'd like Ken to address, <laughs> address how that happened, Ken. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. So it is true that uh, uh, communities sometimes do not prioritize uh, uh, the child protection uh, or issues of child protection. But what happened is that uh, in our case, we had we we invested in in uh, being part of the community and trying to understand the community and also trying to address issues of expectation. As you know that in most of the communities you find that uh, because of how NGO interventions are designed, there are very high expectations when you go into the community. They tell you, we want this, we want this, we want this. What we did is that we invested a bit of time to try and, and address those expectations. And we explained to them that for us, uh, we are interested in learning about children, but we are not a typical NGO that we, that we train you on child protection or we, give you money to take your, ch your, your children to school or we give you a book uh, uh, to support you in taking your children to school. So we invested time in doing that. And uh, that also gave the community an opportunity to uh, reflect, help reflect and think about the achievement. So it was a process. Uh, initially, the community uh, chose to address issues of children being out of school. But when we went back after the learning phase, we found that the community had formed a small committee that had already addressed issues of children being out of school. So they were walking door to door and uh, supporting uh, fellow parents and caregivers and uh, requesting them and advising them to take the children back to school. By the time we went back, 
there was no child who was uh, out of school. And so they settled on early pregnancy. But they asked themselves a question, how do we address early pregnancy? And then the community had a discussion and found that the root cause of early pregnancy in that particular community was uh, early sex. So what they decided is, instead of addressing early pregnancy, why don't we address the root cause? And that is how the community arrived at addressing early sexual abuse. Uh, the intention was actually to address the cause, which was early sex, to address uh, their issue of interest, which was uh, early pregnancy. Thank you. Thanks. We'll take one more question. I've noted down some of the others. We can come back after breakout sessions and, and perhaps enter a couple. Um, so one from Sandra. Um, how were the facilitators chosen, trained, and supported, and were they community members? Then you should address this. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, sorry, so uh, the facilitators were chosen in this sense. So we had a very uh, competitive process of choosing facilitators. And we, we did recruitment in a different way from the normal recruitment process. But one of the things that we looked at is that uh, the facilitator had to speak the same language and had to come from the same culture, but not from the same community because we were aware of the biases that might uh, emerge if the facilitator com comes from the same community. So uh, uh, we went out and uh, did an advert, a normal uh, advert. Uh, uh, then there were applications uh, that came in. Uh, so other than we didn't use the academic qualification or just uh, the experiences working with children. We, our emphasis was on how, how do you relate uh, uh, with the community? Are you accommodative? Are you patient? Uh, are you able to address conflicts that will emerge uh, within the community? Are you someone who is able to empathize uh, with the community? Are you someone who can listen? Are you someone who can give uh, community members space to uh, talk about their issues, give them space to make decisions, give them space to take uh, leadership. So those, those are our main uh, focus in terms of uh, recruitment. So we organized a workshop where we tested all these qualities that you were looking for in a facilitator. And eventually we arrived at a facilitator. But the facilitator didn't also go straight into the community. We had a process where we did several capacity building for, for the facilitator, but mainly looking at those particular skills outside just academic qualifications and outside just experience working with communities and working with people. Thank you. Great, thanks everybody. We're going to um, move into breakout rooms now. We have a couple of questions you'll find on group map um, and it would be great if you can um, again, if you're comfortable, turn off your cameras. We'll do our best to move you into your language preference groups. Um, so I think we'll move into that now. So I think everybody's coming back. I think everyone's here, okay. Um, so we had a bit of a glitch. We were meant to ask two questions on group map, which I popped around to a few breakout rooms and realized that um, seemed that there was a discussion happening. So I hope that even if you weren't discussing the questions that we have up here, that you were you still were able to speak with some of the presenters or, or discuss the presentation. So apologies for that um, glitch. But I'll hand over to Mike, Kathleen and Ken for any final thoughts or key takeaways that you would like to highlight before we move on to the second half of the session? Thanks everyone for these good ideas. I mean, I think that uh, it's encouraging to see the dialogue about this. Um, one key takeaway that I would uh, offer is that 
um, we are in a process of changing uh, you know, the asymmetry of power uh, that exists between uh, the global north and people in Lamic countries. And I would suggest that this kind of process could be useful in the localization strategies that are emerging. And I think that the heart of a community-led approach and a people-led approach is enabling local people to make the decisions. So it fundamentally changes our orientation from being experts to really being co-learners and to sharing greater power and respecting the wisdom that's inherent in communities, their uh, power structures, their uh, natural leaders, and their capacities for change. But uh, this points us to uh, future work and prevention, and I look forward to learning about that and pursuing it with you. So thanks very much for a very useful discussion, and um, thanks for joining. Bye-bye. Over to you, Selena. Yeah, thank you, Carla. Thank you um, all very much for sharing your learning and um, with us. So we'll move over now to Clemence, who will be uh, sharing her presentation. So over to you, Clemence. Right. Thank you so much, Selena, and uh, thank you, Mike, Kathleen, and uh, and Ken for your presentation. Um, I want to apologize in advance, I got a cold and so I have been coughing and sneezing fairly regularly, which uh, might be slightly disturbing for the presentation, but I hope not too much. Um, so I'm very, I'm very excited to be here presenting to you guys today. Um, one of the programs we've been working on for the past uh, three years. Uh, with UNICEF and implementing partners in Lebanon as well as the um, as a government. Um, I just wanted to say a few, a few words of introduction before I start talking about, about Kudwa um, and the work we've done in, in Lebanon. Um, I think most people in the room are actually child protection practitioners, which is um, absolutely great. Um, I want to confess that I am not a child protection practitioner. Um, as Selena mentioned initially, I'm a social and behavioral change expert. Um, and since Magenta is not really your usual suspect uh, when it comes to this kind of, uh, of conference. Um, I think for us, we've been working a lot on, on child production issues, on parenting, on early childhood development um, over the years. Um, and every single time we work on those issues, we obviously work on it from a prevention lens. Um, because we want to try to understand the root causes of those issues uh, to ensure that, you know, we can prevent them from happening in the first place. Uh, Sorry, can, people mute themselves. Uh, thank you. So, yeah, I think by, by, by nature, by design, we basically focus on, on prevention. Um, and I think we'll have quite a nice uh, linkages to the community-led approaches uh, that the, the team before we're, we're, we're talking about. Um, so basically, we started working with um, UNICEF and the Ministry of uh, Social Affairs in Lebanon uh, in 2018. Um, as you know, Lebanon has been uh, a crisis context for, for quite a while now. Uh, the Syrian refugee crisis has added strain on um, host population, in addition to obviously the strain faced by the refugee themselves in a country where there was already a lot of Palestinian refugees as well, uh, sort of like compounded, compounded layers of, of vulnerabilities. Um, one of the challenges that was appearing uh, over the years is that violence against women, girls and boys, um, child labor and child marriage uh, were all prevalent um, and rising actually across all demographic groups in Lebanon. Um, and that was despite a lot of work being done already on awareness raising, uh, on making sure that uh, people knew about um, violence against women, and girls and boys, um, and a lot of um, work with uh, training of, of parents uh, and communities. Um, so we had around 85% of children experiencing violent discipline at home, 35% uh, of Syrian women uh, aid, married before 18, compared to 13% before the conflict. Um, there was a, around 180,000 uh, children working, uh, where there was only 100,000 in, in 2006. So pretty grim picture. Um, 
So what we what we did really was trying to look at this core idea um, of this year's summit, uh, looking at how can we look at primary prevention uh, and prevent the largest numbers to um, become uh, victims of, of child protection issues. Um, so first we started by looking at trying to get reliable data uh, to better understand not only the prevalence, but the root causes of violence against children. And I'll speak a bit more to that. Um, and then we were looking at equipping government stakeholders and implementing partners uh, with a really robust social and behavioral change uh, strategy. Uh, and then we, we wanted to provide frontline workers uh, with behavioral science inspired tools uh, to really shift caregiving behaviors in, in their local communities. Um, and we wanted to use also edutainment uh, informational content to really spark nationwide uh, dialogue on commonly accepted forms of, um, of violence. Um, so we looked at a really kind of 360 degree approach uh, where we spent significant amount of time understanding and planning, uh, going into the design and we're currently in, in the execution uh, of, uh, of a seven year plan. Um, so we started by a really kind of like in-depth, uh, fairly innovative behavioral research uh, that was conducted with uh, quite a range of partners in, in Lebanon. Um, we used, um, I'm not sure if, you, if anyone in the virtual room is familiar with the behavioral drivers model, uh, which is a model that is inspired uh, from uh, behavioral science, trying to understand the enablers and barriers uh, to um, some of the behaviors and practices we're looking to, um, to address. Um, so we really use that model uh, that I will walk you through briefly to develop all of our methodology and tools. Uh, and then um, with local partners, we're conducting around 125 FGDs, 58 key point interviews. So quite a large scale uh, qualitative approach uh, to be able to get the level of, of disaggregation we were looking at. Um, and so we basically used uh, that as a way to, to inform um, all of the, the strategies we were looking at to shift behaviors. Um, so the model, it looks a bit complicated on this slide, but actually it's, it's not when you start thinking about it. I think what we're trying to look at is how do we shift from that traditional model that, you know, you have a harmful behavior, um, you raise awareness and hence you change behavior, which has often been the um, premises of a lot of uh, prevention interventions. Um, whereas we know that behavior is not only driven by awareness and information, but by actually a whole other range of factors, um, including um, your environment, so your legal framework, your structural barriers, um, your communication environment, what are people talking about, what are the media talking about, is there existing emerging alternatives, it's also obviously uh, supported uh, by uh, all of your social environment, including social influence and norms, all of your community dynamics. Uh, so I think linking back to the previous presentations, um, what do people want to change? What do they perceive as, uh, as the issues? Um, meta norms, um, even more so gender norms. Uh, and then at the psychological and individual level, there's everything from your self-efficacy, your interest, and cognitive biases that also play a role. In any case, what we wanted to try to look at with the research was understanding uh, in a non-linear manner what uh, impacted those behaviors. We found that cognitive dissonance between uh, widespread disapprobation of violence against children um, and its practice was, was really important. So that meant people were against uh, violence and disapproval of their communities, but still practiced it. Um, those deeply held beliefs that violence as a method of discipline is effective, stress and fatigue uh, really obviously contributed to negative coping mechanism. Um, notions of control and protection uh, were very deeply entrenched in collective identity and um, gender inequality played a huge role, uh, obviously, in, in the perpetration of those harmful norms. Um, harmful behaviors uh, such as violent discipline were, because, were normalized uh, and there was social pressure to conform. Uh, which really impeded the adoption of positive behaviors. Um, and then we had challenges around the family unit taking primacy over individual well being. So, our traditional Western approach of individual empowerment didn't really work. 
Um, and then a fairly common uh, finding, which is the puberty being associated with the end of childhood. Uh, and what did that mean for actually violence against uh, children? We took all of those findings and we met with um, the government, with a bunch of UN agencies, international NGOs, uh, local partners, implementers, um, and identified four key areas based on the research uh, where social and uh, behavioral change communication could play a role. So first, we wanted to really develop a conducive social environment for the adoption of the protective behaviors. Uh, we wanted to promote positive individual attitudes toward nurturing, caregiving, and nonviolent behaviors. Um, we wanted to make sure that targeted communities were empowered to act and lead the change so that that could come from within uh, and to increase individual self-efficacy for protective behaviors. Um, so we developed the first of its kind of uh, seven years cross-sectoral SBCC strategy that was led by the Ministry of Social Affairs in Lebanon. Uh, and that has uh, started to be implemented in 2020. Um, and for that, we came up with kind of like a central idea. So we wanted to really strip away from uh, judgment. Um, and really what we decided was our key commonality was that really everyone felt that they know better uh, than anyone else what is right for their family. Uh, and we really wanted to build on that, on that sentiment of, you know, ownership, like I know better, I want to like do the best for my family. Um, to enable parents and caregivers to actually make the best choices. Um, and so we developed um, our own uh, identity and platform, uh, which is called Kudwa. Um, and so Kudwa means, means role model in Arabic. Um, it's, it's a non-gendered word. Uh, it works across most population. We, we tested it and trialed it throughout the country. Uh, and the idea that it ties all of our intervention together, but not only, it also provides a platform for individual communities and entities to take actions of their own and to develop their own interventions. Uh, so whereby where they identify an issue or challenge, they can develop the, they can take action and they can use the Kudua tools uh, and the toolkit to link up to some uh, more national effort. Uh, with the idea that kind of like amplified each other. Um, we trained a lot of implementing partners on the strategy uh, and on the tools uh, to make sure that they can could discuss it within their communities uh, throughout the country. We adopted the strategy was adopted in, in 2019. Uh, and amazingly, it got a lot of uh, quite significant budget got allocated for the implementation over seven years with a range of implementing partners, uh, both local and internationals. But a few things that have happened since then was the development of a positive caregiving toolbox uh, with a mix of self-guided resources for caregivers and tools for frontline workers. Um, we also developed a mobile application to increase caregiver self-efficacy uh, with information and tools to adopt a nurturing and positive approach focused specifically on child behavior management. And then we're looking at uh, edutainment work to spark nationwide dialogue on violence against children and try to reframe uh, social norms around what's acceptable or not uh, in terms of, of violence. Um, so in terms of the toolbox, uh, we really looked at a gamification approach. One of the challenges we were facing when we were discussing uh, with all of the implementing partners and people working in the communities was the fact that also they had really great tools and training curriculums, um, including a lot of work around like parenting, around GBV. Um, very often the setup meant that you know, they were in quite dry condition with a flip chart, uh, with not really kind of like any fun engaging tools to get people interested. And very often also the kids ended up having to like wait outside of the sessions and not being really kind of like included. Um, so what we were looking at was also developing tools that the frontline workers could use to support their um, sharing of the curriculum while not only engaging with parents and caregivers, but also bringing the kids into the sessions um, and also making sure that those tools could also be self-guided if needed, which actually proved really useful during COVID, um, where you could just leave it with the parents or the caregivers and that they could use it on themselves. Um, so we looked at things like, um, the fairly traditional thing, like we did, we did a bunch of coloring books 
uh, we did um, but we did also a, a board game. We did a bunch of um, animations trying to explain to, her, to parents and showcase the complexity of a child's brain. So where you go into a little journey uh, into a child's brain development. Um, we have developed quite a lot of very interactive tools. So we developed a playmat, like a physical playmat where parents can kind of like learn by also flipping um, some of the elements while playing with their kids. Uh, we developed a uh, Velcro timeline where parents can put up like different patches on where they think um, a specific events in their child's life, uh, what, what age did it happen so that they can understand, for instance, that, you know, if at age um, one a child is teasing and crying, then it's probably yeah just because of teasing issues and not because of anything else and so being able to understand uh, and get that comfort as parents and um, can limit violence um we created interactive journals trivia games uh, a, a bunch of different tools uh, which we've also been using actually in, in a bunch of different contexts and are really uh, working and complementing some of uh, the great curriculum that child protection practitioners have been developing uh, those are a few of the examples of those. Uh, this is a playmat, uh, what it looks like with all of the different flips. There's a little trivia game on, on the right hand side. Uh, we developed a whole playing card uh, game set, uh, which was mainly looking at engaging men uh, in cafes. Um, so yeah, happy to kind of like uh, talk a bit more about what each of those tools has got quite a few and limited time to, to go through this. Um, well, actually, I wanted to show you very briefly uh, what the kind of like little video looks like. Um, this is inspired by the IRC Families Make the Difference curriculum, um, where there's a few, a few elements of explaining how the child brains function, which um, were always a bit challenging to explain to parents. And so we, we created those little videos that are also being displayed in clinics. And so Professor Neuron is, uh, is kind of like the key the key actor of those. Um, and then um, we are also about to launch an app uh, where we're looking at really improving caregiver self-efficacy uh, that's modeled out uh, on, um, you know, a bit of pre-pregnancy apps, uh, but also trying to look at how can we leverage all of the behavioral insights we've garnered uh, over the years and during the research to really design something that is uh, really user-friendly uh, but also culturally and contextually appropriate. Um, something that is kind of like easy uh, to access, uh, doesn't take much bandwidth uh, and can uh, really be, be useful for, for all parents. Um, and then finally, we're looking at digitalizing edutainment uh, as a catalyst for national conversation and um, really trying to see how we can try to spot dialogues around uh, what can be very challenging um, issues uh, to complement also some of the work we've been doing at the community level. Um, and I don't want to take that too much more time. I think I'm arriving at the end of my allocated slot. Um, but yeah, really um, happy to, to take a few more questions and, uh, and discuss this uh, with, with all of you. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Clemence. This is really amazing work. and. I think it's so interesting um, to learn from you and others, you know, that might not be working specifically in child protection, but we can certainly as child protection actors apply some of the work that other fields have done. So this is a great example of that. And I see in the chat, there's been several, um, several of the participants asking where they can find the, the toolkit. So is that available and can it be shared? Yeah, we can. Um, if you if you write to me, I put my email in the chat. I can put you. Uh, I can I can link you up. Um, absolutely. Great. Um, and there's one question from Hajar about uh, which country the tools were developed for. Um, so the tools were developed for. I mean, it was developed in Lebanon. Uh, for the context of Lebanon, but not only for Lebanese, it was developed to be actually um, to work with um, both so with Syrians, Palestinians, and uh, Lebanese populations. Uh, 
Great. Um, put in modern standard Arabic. Uh, so yeah, fairly easy to use across different countries in the region. Great. Yeah, if, if anyone else has uh, other questions or would like to unmute themselves and, and pose your question directly, please feel free to do so. Um, yeah, I see Megan is asking if the toolkit is, uh, is translatable, uh, which I think, yes, abs absolutely. Um, there might be like, there, there, it's definitely adaptable and translatable. Um, all of the visual elements are very much Middle Eastern uh, focused uh, because of the context, but they can be adapted, uh, yeah, depending on the context. And how long did the formative research and design take? Uh, so the formative research took, I need to go check back, but it, it, did, it did take a while. Um, it took, I think, around eight months, uh, all inclusive uh, methodology, data collection, um, analysis. Uh, but it's quite a large quantity of data, which looking back, I mean, is really, it was really great, but was it necessary to have that much data is, is an open question, to be honest. Um, design, I think the first iteration of the toolbox was done in, um, in six months. I think the finalization always takes a bit of time because uh, we're doing a lot of, of back and forth on with all of the stakeholders and all of the implementing partners in making sure that every kind of like little uh, tweaks uh, can work. Arabic is also quite a challenging one because uh, everyone has different opinions on what is the correct phrasing. Um, but the toolbox is fairly iterative, so we keep on adding actually over the years. We just do like new components uh, of the toolbox. We just finished the second round actually. Um, Great. Sandra has asked, how were children and parents involved in shaping the, the tools um, or, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think, um, so, I mean, the formative research was very much more focused on uh, understanding the behavioral drivers. Um, then actually in, in the tool, we did a lot of uh, testing within the communities and quite like, so we had all of our initial concept, which we uh, pre-tested mainly with frontline workers and community workers. Um, and then once we had initial draft prototypes, uh, we tested those with the frontline workers and the communities, uh, really uh, like gathered community feedback, uh, which actually were also used in the second, um, uh, the second draft of the tool, not draft, sorry, the second iteration of the tool when we did the second toolbox. Uh, some of those tools that were requested um, or that came up in those testing were also added to the second iteration. Uh, for instance, the the called the the games of, uh, of the deck of cod, uh, for instance, was something that came up uh, by, by men quite a lot. And maybe one final question. Um, how many, do you know how many users are currently using the app in Lebanon? We're just finalizing the prototyping, actually, so it's about to be launched. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, they, will, they will definitely, we will share that data as soon as we have it. Um, I just have seen the last question. I think, I mean, uh, there, was, there was FGDs with, uh, with children, actually, as part of the 125. So they were actually FGDs dedicated to, to kids. Yeah, great. That's, um, okay, so now we're going to go into our second breakout rooms. We have a couple of questions on Google Maps. So if you can click on the Google Map, um, hopefully it will, uh, there won't be any glitches this time around. And we'll have about 10 minutes in the breakout rooms to discuss a couple of questions. Looks like everyone's rejoining. Yeah. I'll just wait. Looks like there's still some coming in. I popped around to a couple of the breakout rooms and it seems like there was some very engaging conversations happening, uh, which is great. So. Clemence, I'll hand over back to you for um, to summarize kind of a few key takeaways. So I said, is there a way, uh, maybe Jessica, that we could share the screen with, uh, I don't know, do I have it? Actually, I have it. Yes, I can do it. 
Uh, great, thank you. Um, yeah, so good. I, I did get a bit sidetracked in a, in a great discussion. Um, but yeah, so I just wanted to ask actually in what ways can uh, social norms help us? Uh, and I'm glad to see there's a lot, uh, a lot of different ideas. Um, really, I think we've, we've heard a lot this ideas of uh, avoiding simplified responses and, and designing activities that are culturally acceptable uh, and really understanding um, what are the root causes of, of behaviors. Uh, so this last comment, like we cannot change behavior if we do not understand uh, what shaped it to begin with is, is absolutely key. Um, and so I think we can all, um, all learn from doing also more in-depth uh, behavioral research. And I think for me, one of the key takeaway I wanted um, everyone to leave with is also that, I mean, there are a lot of tools to do this type of behavioral research and it doesn't need to be really long actually or and this one was probably not the best example of a not very long behavioral research but it doesn't need to be really long it doesn't need to be really expensive uh you can actually get a lot of really good insights um really easy like fairly easily by asking the right the right question and being curious um and i think on the challenges um yeah supporting grassroots movements uh definitely um community being afraid of change and not wanting to change uh you may try and work out arriving with opinions um so i think a lot of this we were also uh i've, I've heard quite a bit uh in, in the groups and we were discussing and i think for us uh one of the next uh, really important step uh in making sure that um the social norms uh work can be really impactful is that then once we've managed to like basically empower communities, frontline workers, community workers to identify uh, some of those issues and work towards them, we also need to make sure that we can kind of like close that feedback loop uh, and that all of those, once we've been able to start to kickstart conversation and dialogue uh, and that people can uh, start designing their own solutions, then how do we take that back to also the international communities to programmers, how do we put that on top of the agenda? Uh, and I think that's something that um, is, is quite uh, key uh, for us at the moment. Down the next steps. I don't know how we're doing on time, Tarina, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, that's perfect. Uh, right on the hour. So thank you very much, Clemence, for sharing this set knowledge and learning, as well as to Mike, Ken, and Kathleen um, for presenting. I just wanted to um, make a note that we're sharing a couple resources. So from the first presentation on the, the toolkit for the community-led approach, and then um, for Clemence's presentation, the, the link to the, to the research that informed this work. So please do um, copy these in and, and read those resources. And I'd like to thank you all for joining the session and participating in some very active discussions. Um, if you would like, you can, um, we'll add in a Mentimeter to just add, write in one word your key takeaway from this session as you're kind of getting ready to either end for the day or you can rejoin the Philo space. Um, we'll be celebrating the fifth year anniversary of the Alliance after this session, um, but feel free to um, write in your key takeaway from the this session now and once again i'd like to thank all of the presenters for sharing your knowledge and learning with us today